Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the Committee of the Finance and Facilities here in the Lindholm Building. Uh, first order of business is to verify the meeting was properly posted. Yes, it was. Okay. Second order of business is opportunity for citizens to speak. I believe we have at least one citizen tonight. Mrs. Piacek, Kelly, did you do the sign in? I did. Okay, we'll hand it over there so they know who's. Sit down and enjoy. You don't need to play with the iPad quite yet. We have another party for that. Sorry. Okay, proceed. Hold on, hold on. Mike isn't on yet. There you go. Uh, Kelly Piasek, N22W26515, Shooting Star Road in Pewaukee, Wisconsin, um, parent in the Waukesha School District. And I'm here tonight um, really simply to express my gratitude to this committee and to members of the school board, along with Chairman O'Brien and Superintendent Gray, for listening to our parents' concerns over the last six months. We came to you with an issue regarding facility access and some priority arrangements um, that created challenges for us as parents. And um, while not always an easy discussion, we do appreciate you engaging in the discussion and um, greatly appreciate the unanimous decision that the school board reached in March to terminate the facility use agreement with an outside party. Um, while we appreciate that that creates some financial challenges for the district, especially in a year where we're facing some budget shortfalls, um, we are very optimistic that um, removing some of the exclusivity to one group will allow other organizations to come forward and also benefit from our facilities. And so for that, uh, I, on behalf of the uh, Junior North Stars and Junior Basketball programs, I'm very grateful. Um, I would say that you know that that decision just a few days before that, um, we we learned from Waukesha County Technical College that they are actually going to close their field house and convert that space into an educational facility. And so, for the last four years, the facilities that we have used to offset the challenges that we've had with gym access um, will no longer be available to us. And so um, we look forward to the future partnership. I can say on a very positive note um, in appreciation to the administra administration that um, there is a meeting already set for May between uh, district athletic directors and youth program leaders to start some priority discussion about facilities. And so um, many things have happened in the last six months that we are uh, very appreciative of. Um, you know, I would just conclude by saying that we parent volunteers, uh, parent advocates, um, uh, you know, it's difficult to come forward with challenges and with questions. And um, as I know that it's difficult for you board members to field those questions and challenges and sometimes make unpopular decisions, um, but we're in this for the same reasons. We are all here to do what's in the best interest of our students, both physically and intellectually. And I think we all kind of hope for them to leave our care down the road and go into society and do great things for us. Um, and so we share that mission. Um, and we are very open to continuing to partner with you. Uh, certainly North and South have already engaged in discussions with elementary schools in our feeder areas for opportunities to improve our gyms and our facilities. And so we look forward to that. We're open to it, um, and again, just greatly appreciate your willingness to hear us out, uh, good, bad, and otherwise. So thank you very much. Do we have any other citizen speakers tonight? Okay. No, well, we don't get thank yous too often, but they're nice when they come, huh? <laughs> I think in my career I have all three of the thank you notes I've <laughs> yeah, yeah. 24 years. You have three thank you notes framed from 24 years yes, of service. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, action items. Approval of the minutes from the March meeting. I move to approve the minutes as presented. Second. Okay, Ms. Voigt. 
moved to approve. Mr. McCaffrey, second. Any additional discussion on the matter? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 5 0. Approval of vouchers. There was one voucher question this month, and that was for voucher 327340 for James Imaging. And the question was when did we last bid out our copying services? And um, we're in year four of a five year contract. We started this contract in 2015 16 with James Imaging, and we'll be going to our, they'll be working on an RFP, they being uh, IT department. We'll be working on an RFP next year. They're already putting feelers out and looking at what's out there and what's available. And okay. so we'll be going to bid again next year. Thank you. You're welcome. That was it for vouchers. Okay, Mr. Como. I move approval of the vouchers as presented. Second. Mr. Como moves for approval. Mr. McCaffrey seconds. Do I have additional discussion on the matter? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 5 0. Next action item approval of Waukesha Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math Academy Charter School contract. So I'll come up. Um, I believe we have a presenter, is that right? What was that? I guess you're taking over. Go ahead. I was just going to say I am subbing for Dr. Gray, and um, so we have Melissa and, and James from the STEM campuses here to talk about uh, the renewal of um, the STEM charter agreement. Um, it is a five-year agreement. Um, and that, that language for the term is on the back page of the, the contract, but I'll, I'll turn it over for them. They have a very short six or seven slide uh, PowerPoint presentation, and then we can answer any questions you might have um, related to the, the charter agreement. So we just wanted to make sure, um, I know that you guys have the red line version of the charter contract. Uh, so we just wanted to walk you through some of the big things that were happening and just some of the changes. So uh, you're going to see, I know that there was uh, a comment, oh, you know, that there was a lot changed. And it looks like there's a lot of red, but a lot of it is policy and wording updates. So with the policy changes that have been happening and the updating that the board has been doing with the policies, um, this is a five-year contract. So five years ago, some of the policy numbers have changed. So we went through, and with the help of uh, Bill Baumgartner, Bob, Bill Baumgartner, Sorry, I have a Baumgartner at my school. So, uh, and uh, Sue Ettinger, we were able to update all of those. So that was a lot of the changes. And just aligning the language to SDW language so that we're all consistent across the board. Not just that it's STEM, but that it's SDW language. So we're all consistent that way. So that was some of the changes that you're seeing. Uh, ooh, that's a little bit hard to read, sorry about that. Uh, next is the enrollment, and that's on page seven, article 10A. So if you have that in front of you. Page seven of the contract, page eight of the packet. Oh, sure. thanks, Darren. <coughs> so if you have that, you can, kind of, you can see um, we moved the old wording was based on class sections uh, or classes and sections, and we moved that to have overall building capacity. So the overall building capacity at 504 at Randall and 336 at Saratoga. Yeah, go ahead. Some of the, the rationale behind that too, I think that we're seeing is um, when we have a waiting list at specific grade levels and a deficit at others, then we're losing students quite honestly. Um, so for instance, at Saratoga, there's 336 students max capacity. There's 112 per grade level. Um, we don't have grade levels at Saratoga per se. Uh, on paper there are for enrollment, but there, it's a competency-based system. So if this upcoming year we had 130 apply for sixth grade, um, you know, we'd have 112 seats open. We'd have to lock out those other X amount of students. And if we had 10 openings in seventh and 10 openings in eighth, we couldn't accept, you know, we can't roll those sixth graders in. That's sort of what this, this uh, amend, you know, if we wanted to amend this, that's what we're looking to do. The other thing is that if a student or family is looking for a STEM environment, um, not even a charter, just a STEM project-based learning, a competency-based model, 
it's sort of tough to find right now, even in Wisconsin. Um, even with Kettle Moraine, I think are, are going to be going through some shifts right now. What we're really trying to do is attract and retain those families all the way through high school then. Uh, and what we're seeing is if we start that at a kindergarten level all the way through eighth grade, those students will maintain. Families, quite honestly, don't leave the STEM system from K to eight that often. But what we are seeing now is a heavy, heavy increase in families coming from other districts, coming from homeschool situations, and then coming from other uh, non-project-based learning environments that want to try a middle school with that environment. Last year, we had a waiting list of 50 at sixth grade for the first time <coughs> since our first year, which was really cool. Uh, and then we were a little bit shy of our max capacity in 7th and 8th. So last year would have been a great example of where we could have rolled those students up into 6th grade if those slots were still available, still within our maximum capacity. K through, kinder through 5th, excuse me, would work the right. same way where if, you know, kindergarten had a waiting list but 1st grade had openings or 2nd grade had openings, you would shift those students into those grades. I know the big question that arises, and that's probably the elephant in the room, is what about FTEs? How does that affect budget? How does that affect? Um, it, it would be no different because the max capacity would not change. So those FTEs, it'd be like at, a, at any other school in SDW, if you had a large section of fourth grade classes, maybe four of them, you know, as that group travels to fifth grade, you're gonna need four more teachers. If there were only three sections in fifth grade the year prior, you're going to need to add a teacher. Quite honestly, that's why shifts occur within our buildings, and that's sort of age old. Um, so this is sort of that support of that rationale is that we're seeing an increase in students applying to our both campuses right now. Um, we're, we're, already, we're turning away families each year, but then have openings in other grades. Uh, and so we'd really like to maintain and continue to grow our program all the way through eighth, which in turn would retain students for our high schools, R4, um, and then beyond, which I think is a great, great, it's a good problem to have when there's a waiting list at that point because I'm not calling families on the second day of school saying, I'm sorry, but we cannot accept you because we're full. Uh, the first question that families always say is, but there's space is open in your school, which is a legitimate question. So it's hard, it's not hard to justify because it was in the charter. It'd be easier to talk to them and say, you know what, we have openings in our school, even though sixth grade was full. Um, <coughs> it's not difficult in our system to make those, those to adapt to that change. It's very easy for us to do within our, our situation, um, where it, it quite often is multi-age and then it's competency-based as well. Um, it's not like another school where we have to rethink our entire staffing model at all. It can happen overnight can happen that same day if we just sit down, look at rosters, talk to teachers, have a team meeting. Um, the staff at both sites are extremely flexible too. So. Thank you. So what does that look like in a classroom then, especially from K or kinder through fifth grade? If you've got more students, let's say at a third grade level, or at a kindergarten level. I mean, there's still classrooms at Randall. I know Saratoga is more wide open where you could throw in another 10 kids if you needed to, but those classrooms are only so big, so now you've got more kids in a classroom. I know that they're at their, their own pace and at their own levels, but you still have a lot of bodies in a room. So what does that look like at the elementary level? Yeah, we wouldn't be adding students like so we wouldn't go above um, because I think uh, district the hope is is that there's 28 in a classroom. I think that that's kind of been our general rule of thumb and I think that that's what it has been across the district. Um, so we wouldn't be adding, we wouldn't be going above that. We would be adding, so for example, if we added on level three to a four or five classroom, we'd be adding another four or five classroom. So instead, so we'd be shifting those students. So if we had more on the wait list that we could accept to get to our um, enrollment, to our um, capacity, we would add a classroom. So not, not adequately add a physical classroom, but you know, we would just move the space around and shift. And so we would be putting students in another space. So do you understand, does that help? Does that under do you understand? We'd, we'd but, add another section, more <clears throat> or less. So like if we had four Spanish classes running with 10 kids each right. in them, and 50 kids applied for Spanish, we'd build a fifth section of Spanish. Ultimately, that's what we would do at Randall. Because the ratios per our contract with the uh, state would, cannot exceed 28 to 1. And so even if we wanted to, we couldn't do that. Um, and so it would, it would maintain the integrity of that class size. 
um, and still maintain also an FTE balance that was equivalent to that of SDW. Uh, another change. Oh, do you have a question? Let's see if there's any other questions. <coughs> okay. Go ahead. All right. Um, the other change is uh, priority enrollment for siblings, and that is on page nine, which I, or page eight, which I'm thinking is on page nine of your packet. Um, Article 10 CA, it's enrollment priority. And this is actually giving sibling priority at all grade levels for currently enrolled and attending students. So right now, the priority is, or siblings at the kindergarten level get enrollment priority. So for example, if they have a sibling that is either in an older grade at, St at Saratoga, at Randall, or at Saratoga, if they have a kindergarten sibling, that kindergarten sibling is automatically granted a seat. Um, do you want to ask before I finish? I'm finished. I'm just okay. waiting. All right. I, I was hoping you'd have something. So as we were moving forward, um, we are looking at uh, making and opening that up because we do have a lot of siblings because of the wait list that that happens to. So that has never moved anyone or we've always, um, we've, since I, I have been there the last three years, we haven't had a wait list at kindergarten. So um, those students that take those seats or any siblings that take those seats at kindergarten, there are still open spots for district, other district students to come in. And it would never bump a student. So if a grade level was full, it would right. not knock a student out of their seat, their current seat. Um, the other thing that we said in the, the update was that it was, it has to be an attending student at that point in time. So a student couldn't apply, and then 10 seconds later, the family says, well, my student's a STEM student. Now my other four brothers get in. It has to be a currently attending student. So we wanted to be very careful how we worded that um, so people didn't game the system or, you know, sort of so go about it that way. An example of this, I guess, would be in the <coughs> first two years, you might know um, a family. We had quadruplets at our school um, who were actually s split for enrollment. Not all four got in. We also had twins where the same exact thing happened. Students can enter our school into the second day of school at 3 o'clock p.m. Um, so actually there's a, 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 an individual that oversees the city right now whose sons were at our school. One got in and one did not. And so by splitting that family, they were just going to pull the son that was in. So they didn't have to go to two separate middle schools at that point in time. Um, not that that's common practice, and it's definitely not the anomaly, but it does happen more frequently than we'd think. Um, especially with students at two sites, families that are at two sites. To have to split and drive across town seems to be something that they don't really want to do. Um, so if that sibling priority is put into place, it's not just a kindergarten student that's coming in. It could be kinder through fifth or six, seven, eight, obviously. So um, we're seeing a lot of students coming in at eighth grade, quite honestly, at this point, which to me is sort of mind blowing. And you know, I'd never think a student would change schools in eighth grade, but they are, they want to explore options prior to high school and a lot of times they do have siblings. And so quite often when they're there for their eighth grade year, they find that they love it. The family applies the next year with their family to either Randall or to Saratoga, which is really cool to see, bringing in two, three, four more students to STEM. So, and then in turn to SDW. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with this discussion. I mean, we're talking about, um, I understand why we want to keep families together and students together and all that stuff, but there's no qualification of whether those students really belong in the STEM program, other than the fact that they won the lottery. One child out of their family won the lottery and now they're all in. I mean, and they have a priority over anybody else because one <coughs> out of four won the lottery and yet we don't really look at, is this the right environment for those siblings? We just say you're in. And I don't see how that's necessarily good I, I understand the idea of trying to keep families together, and I'm in favor of that. I'm not in favor of just saying you're all in because one, one, one of the four got in. Not only that, it gives that family an advantage over another family. If I have one child, I only get to put in one lottery ticket. If I have four child, children, I can put in four, and I get in all four by being able to put in four tickets instead of one ticket. So it's really not a fair system. That's as a great what, point. Yeah. <clears throat> and I would agree with that. And, and so now you get an eighth grader in. Mm -hmm. He happens to be the one who won the lottery. So his entire family qualifies underneath him and they take four slots. Okay. Away from maybe some other students that were more suitable for the program. I, 
the whole concept of how we manage the lottery, I do agree that I want to keep families together. I understand that. Yeah, but yeah. having the right children and putting them in the right environment, to me, there has to be something in the charter for that. Um, as we were talking before the meeting, I mean, this is just going to assert, I don't see anything in this that talks about the lack of diversity that we have at STEM right now and addresses that. It's in the charter from before, and it says steps must be taken, but I don't think any steps are being taken. I think it's, you fall quite a bit short of that. And um, I don't think that's acceptable either. So I, those are the areas that when we get into this renewing the charter, that I think we need to address, especially for a five-year contract. I mean, if it was one more year or two more years, maybe I could be, but before we do a five-year contract, I think we need a really good in-depth discussion about these issues. Mr. Como? I want to make sure that I understand what requirements students and families have to meet to enroll into the school. Are there any? Or is it just like any other choice school? So I'm a parent. Um, I want to, I'm in the Randall district and I want to go to Hawthorne. Um, there's no qualification that's going on. I just apply and if there's an opening, I can have my, you know, child go to Hawthorne, um, but there's nothing else qualifying for that. Is there any other qualifications that I'm just not remembering, if there are, for getting into STEM? Yes, there are. Okay, and what are those? You know what you do? You come take a tour. And that's it? Honestly. So. When we opened 10 years ago, and I say 10 because we spent <coughs> an entire year prior planning, uh, the largest point that we really wanted to stress opening, and, and those of you who are on the board at that point or in Waukesha and remember, was that we wanted a diverse population, to your point, Kurt, um, which we're still working to get, but diversity in a sense that there, we didn't want to have the misnomer that this was just us picking chess players out of Waukesha and 4.0 straight A students that were engineers, right? The big thing that we said was from day one, all of us said this to the founding, to current teachers, principals, families, there's no criterion to get into STEM because it is for everybody, it's for anybody. Quite honestly, the tour component to, to the comment I made earlier was just that we want to make sure when a student comes that a parent doesn't just register their kid and say, I want them to be an engineer, a scientist, a mathematician, right? The students have to come through, take a tour, and actually live in the environment and see it. I've had handfuls of students that have come in and five seconds in they say, this is not for me. I could never do this. The, the open concept, the movement, the, the bikes on the wall, like, no way. I've had other students that come through and say, let me think about it. They've called back and said, you know what, we took a tour less Paul Horning and Butler. I like that environment better. The tours are an hour and we go through everything, top to bottom, from the physical to the emotional support, the advisory, the ACP, everything we're doing, all the way down to competency-based models, the flexible scheduling, things like that. Um, so both of you are right, gentlemen, it is not for everybody. Um, and criterion-wise, though, we eliminated it with the exception of they have to understand completely what the model is. That's the criterion. Come through and see it so you know come day one that it's not going to be 60 minutes with a bell ringing and you go to your next class because that's not present. It'll never be. But what will be present is that voice and choice piece, and 85% of students love that and live for that. 15% don't want that environment. They don't. Um, the diversity piece, I would agree, Kurt, we're definitely working to, to strengthen that um, by putting flyers throughout the district, mailing, things like that. The crux that we're running into, I guess, is that if we're a technology school, that's not the reality for this city, this environment, this planet even, because not everybody has that access. Um, so as a district, what are we doing and what are we doing at STEM together to support that? That's something that we talk about at our governing board meetings monthly as well, too. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Coleman. What, what do we do for our other schools <coughs> when we have a choice situation going on and a family would like to stick together? What, are, what do we do? This is unique, right? Yeah, this, this is, is unique. unique. I don't think we follow this process. I'm not an expert in that. So area, it, it would be nice to know and understand that process, though. Well, I, I think, Mr. Como, and I, look, I want to keep families together. I know there's a reason why we made this change in the policy. Uh, I, and I know it, it's not necessarily that 
income is what drives us because I know parents that aren't, you know, they're middle class to maybe not even quite middle class income that take the time to make sure their children can make it to the school because they want their children in the school. I, I know that. Um, but I think that's why I want to, the point Mr. Como made is a good point. You know, when we do choices for other schools, we don't go through this family keeping together scenario. But I understand why we have it for STEM. What I don't understand is the lack of diversity and there is no incentives, no drivers for your, your organization to, to fix that problem. And apparently there's no drivers for the district either because the district should be pushing to fix that problem as much as us asking you. So, um, you know, one of the things I would suggest in the charter that we have a referral process available for um, our community children around the STEM environment and that they don't have to go through the lottery to get in, that they can get seats through referral through whatever reason. Maybe we'll figure out that referral process so they don't have to be through the lottery process. And that would allow us to improve our diversity. The other part of it is if we need to start supplying some transportation to give these children a chance to be in STEM. I mean, we don't want this to be a closed system that's only for the select few. And then when we go to talk about including families, does their families get to have the same access the lottery families do? I would think so. I mean, if we're saying we want to keep families together, I would say that that would be the same criteria. So I believe in expanding STEM. I would like to build more onto Saratoga that have a bigger program there, but not without an improvement in the diversity. Okay. And, um, and I do want to keep families together. I understand that part of it. But I want the right children. I want children not to be forced to go there because my family's going there. And I think that Jim, um, I'm going to reiterate and kind of add on, he, we do, this is a serious conversation that we've had at governing board meetings. We've been talking about you know, what, what are some things, what are some community outreach um, programs that we can start, what are, what are some ideas. We have been having conversation about that. I, um, I apologize that I'm typing because I'm taking notes of what you're saying so we can take that back to the governing board uh, and so we can talk about that further. Uh, but one of the things that we did include in the charter contract with the lottery is the fact of that sibling preference is that it would be currently enrolled and attending students. So to your point, if a student were won the lottery, because you know sometimes like that's sometimes how it feels. Like if there's a lot, like for example, at levels level three, our fourth and fifth grade, I have 20 students on the wait list at fourth and fifth grade. That's a hard grade to get into because students don't leave STEM. So once they're in, if I have any new students coming in, that's a very difficult grade to get into. So once if that student is chosen to come in, if their name is picked in the lottery, that doesn't automatically give all of their siblings a seat. So their name is picked, they have to be currently attending and enrolling, so they would have to go that next year. So those other siblings wouldn't automatically take those seats from anyone else that is on the, on the, you know, on the wait list. They would have to be going. So then that next year, then their siblings, they would already be in, the parents would know the system, the student would be in the system, we would be having conversations because those tours are really so important. The conversations, especially at the elementary level, um, the in-depth conversations that we have with families talking about and going into classrooms and I encourage them to come back and bring their students so they can sit in a classroom and be a part of that environment because it is different than the rest of the district. So we have those conversations because it it's about fit, but it's about personalization too. Yeah, I do remember when we first opened up STEM and we had a, a fair amount of dropouts in that first year because I think of a misunderstanding of really what the program was all about. And, uh, and I applaud you for trying to make sure that there's a fit there with the tour and having a, a, a truly good understanding of you know, what, how, how this is different. Um, and I did speak with some of those families in that first year. And they're like... The, there, were, there were people who really, like, I wish I would have known this. That was kind of a comment. I wish I would have known. And even though, you know, we tried <laughs> to express that this was different and how it was going to be different, I'm sure over the years we've gotten better at um, 
really being able to differentiate for, for parents and yeah, help hey. them to understand. Yeah, and, and I lived that because I was a teacher at STEM that first year and had, I think coming from White, because I was at White Rock for six years where it was so clear to the community what that school was about to going to a school that was brand new where we were building it as we were flying it. Quite honestly, we were. Um, so yeah, the articulation now I think is, is pretty crystal clear as, as we can get to our families, to the nation really. As a nationally recognized school, families hear about it and it, it piques interest. Then they come through and they, it, they, the, the student gets interested and then they learn about it and then they really see whether or not it's a great fit. Um, Kurt, I'm interested in what you said, the referral system. That, to me, really piqued my interest because I, I hear what you're saying with the family sibling priority. I have four kids and you have one, right? So what if one of my four beat out your one, per se? What does that referral system look like to you? Because that, if we can find an ebb and flow or a balance somehow with that to reach the families that don't have that kind of accessibility. Transportation is a no-brainer to me, like somehow down... That, that levels the playing field quite a bit. I know starting at day one, we didn't have that, but it's always, is there a, a local depot where a bus picks up kids? Is there, a, you know, how to, there's a lot of moving parts to that, budget included, but in your mind, it, and you don't have to, if you don't know, that's cool, but the referral system, what do you? Well, let me, let me elaborate on that a little bit clearer. I'm saying if we have um, student services, yeah. or, you know, do an assessment and say, this parent, this child should be considered for STEM <coughs> and they should talk to the parent and child, of course, and, and say, we'd like to refer this parent and this child to the STEM program um, because we feel that this is the best appropriate place for this child relative to their interest. Um, and, you know, when I'd say they'd have the same family benefits that, uh, that someone who went through the lottery system. I think the whole enrollment thing needs to be parsed out, right? When I look at the comment made about um, the fact we don't do this at our other schools when they open enroll, same way with the staff and the teachers. I don't get that clause at all. I, to me, that is just an outrageous clause that automatically, if you work there, your kids get in. I, and you don't even have to be the lottery. You just get in, which takes away spots from other people. And if you're not paying taxes in our community and you're just an educator, you're taking spots away from the people who are paying the taxes for that school. So we need to have a bigger, deeper discussion about enrollment in terms of what's right, what's not right. Um, and I think diversity is probably the number one topic we need to tackle. Look, I, I went to school on an Indian reservation. You know, I was one of 38 kids, right? I had a great science and math teacher and independent studies, so I guess I was like a STEM school without having a STEM, a STEM school of one. We have all sorts of people on those reservations that go on to work at NASA, do different things, because they're able to get an education occasionally with the opportunity. Um, we can't keep our kids trapped in um, a school that's maybe holding them back when we have a STEM school just down the street that they probably should be going to. So if we're going to advance our children to their fullest potential, regardless of race, economic status, whatever, we need to give them access to programs like STEM. And if we have to expend STEM to do that, then so be it. Um, I'd rather have more high-performing elementary schools that include STEM than locking kids in a program that doesn't suit them. So. We need to be more aggressive on this diversity thing, and I just can't support this charter without that. Mr. Ryan, check. Thank you. So I have a few comments to make. Um, one being, I don't believe La Casa has buses. Am I correct on that? Do you guys know? I I'm, couldn't speak to that. I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure they don't. We don't bus for them anyway. They have their own bus. Um, that's a pretty diverse school. Yeah, if buses. parents want their kids to go there, they'll get them there. They're getting them to La Casa. So I don't feel that um, we're closing the door or we're doing anything. We have to make it appealing for them to want to come. We have 
put it on the table, um, they, the, the STEM school wanted to expand and make more seats available and get these waiting lists down. And that didn't go through. So those are two things that just keep coming to my mind when I hear you guys. When we talk about um, a way to get them in through, let's say, one of our, uh, what were you guys saying, um, student services, like let's, let's have 10 set aside, 10 seats, where if they went and spoke to someone and they showed what a science brain or what a, a math brain a, a student was, then, then they could just have a meeting with someone and, and prove that they should be in that school. That is opening up a can of worms. I know as a mom that I had three kids that I wanted to be in there. One was a science kid to the core, and the other two could have gone anywhere. I would have done anything to prove that all three should be there in whatever way I could. And that person who is going to give that special ticket, that golden ticket to those 10 people, are going to have a line out their door. Everyone's going to get the no, oh, we didn't pull your, your child's name, but here's another way you could go. And then it's going to be on that person's shoulders. I just don't see that that would work. If you can think of a way that it would, like Jim, I would love to hear it. But being in this since it started and being on both sides, a parent and here, and, and seeing that this school has always been busting at the seams and them wanting to, to let more seats in and we've given them some options and each time it doesn't happen, I don't think it's their fault. So I just wanted to say those things. Well, if it was me, I'd, I'd, launch, I'd launch a lawsuit against the district for not having enough diversity in the school. If I was, because you need to have diversity. It needs to match somewhat, a little bit closer to the demographics of the community. And we went, I mean, you can just look at the surrounding schools, um, Whittier, Horning. I mean, it's, and I think the problem is, is that there's unwillingness to change because someone will be affected by it. When you start letting other people in that aren't currently in, someone else will be upset because they might be excluded. That's what keeps the status quo rather than making a change that will drive diversity. So, and I'm not blaming STEM. I'm just saying, for us to make this happen, it's going to take a, a change of something. I think population, though, has changed definitely since I've been there, since day one. Um, I, I guess I, and I would even look at the special ed students, the students with an IEP of 504, a student assistance plan, the students that we now service support and are successful at our school has drastically <coughs> grown i would say since year one um to now working with students who are nonverbal, to students who are have multiple things that they are they're working with day by day um, compared to year one has grown our staffing model has changed to to support that like in all schools obviously um, but again there's there's no criterion to get in that's turning any single student away outside of a cap on a grade level. And so at the end of the day, it has nothing to do with color, creed, background, grade point average. If you were suspended a thousand times or if you can work for eight hours a day without me even having to talk to you once, there's, there's zero criterion limiting any student from getting in at this point, with the exception of the seat capacity, quite honestly. And so when we speak about diversity... I, I, I guess I don't agree. When, mm -hmm. I understand that on paper that's true, but in functionality it's not because the status quo is going to continue to drive the dynamics to stay the way you are. And unless we make a sea change in how we encourage that diversity, there will always be that block. It, again, on paper there is no blocks, but in reality there are. I hear you. Yeah, Mr. Como, and, and, and that might be <clears throat> as to what Mrs. Reinecheck was saying. Maybe we need to reach out to different populations and lure them in, make this attractive, and make sure that they understand that this is a school that they can choice into, 
Because I think as, as long as you have choice, how do you control who, who's coming and going? You, you really can't. It's we're giving, we're empowering the parents and the students to make up their minds where they want to go to school with all of our schools. So I, I don't know if we can do anything else other than really just trying to make sure that we reach out to and make sure people truly understand that this is available for them to choose. Well, I'll give them a report card, and right now they got a D to an F in the diversity area. So I just don't give up so that easy. So do you give out a D to an F uh, to Banting um, because... Or to Blair, West or versus to South. you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's not. We don't, we don't have a lottery system. We don't have a special system that's allocated the way we have STEM. And STEM is in a location where they should have a larger proportion of their population in a diverse way. So why don't they? Because the incentives aren't there. And if we keep making the excuse that, well, I'm not. As long as we let people know, no, it's more than that. It is more than that. So, Ms. Ronicek. Thank you. Well, why is South more diverse than West? What would you give West? South reflects the demographics of the community around it. So does West? Yes, it does. But STEM doesn't. Are we giving what? What are we doing to West? Are we giving West? It reflects West the ticket? demographics of the community around it. STEM does not. Okay. So that's the difference. So do you know? But it's not a neighborhood school. Doesn't matter. It doesn't doesn't reflect the demographic. Its charter says it will. Its charter very clearly says it will, and it's not. Are we just going to let it give it a pass on that part of the charter? If so, let's take it out, and just just admit that it's a special school that doesn't have to be reflect the diversity of the district. It's a choice. The charter says it will reflect the diversity of the district. It's very clear in the charter. Are we just gonna ignore that language? Excuse me one second. How many um, Indian kids do we have going to STEM? Do you want me to pull up those demographics? Sure, if you want. I can do that. My son Carson has many friends that are not middle class white kids and that's different in itself versus any other school that I can think of. And I think that's great. So if you're talking Hispanic or African-American, what, what are you thinking about diversity? We have demographics for our school district. It's, the demographic profile is very clear. If she comes up with 25% Asian-Americans in STEM, that doesn't reflect the demographics of our district. I'm sure you won't, but I mean, the demographics are Hispanic, black, white. We probably have five, six, seven very well-represented groups in our school district. Como. But again, it goes back to choice. It's the parents and the students choosing to enroll into the school. And I think the way you resolve <laughs> that diversity issue is by making sure you're reaching out to those people, but they're still making the decision whether or not to enroll in the school. So I, I don't know, do you force them? Look, they're not, they're not, I mean, they're not, this is not a matter of we can't fix this problem. It's a matter that we choose not to. When you say it's their fault, that's just, that's just walking a, away from I didn't from say it. their fault. I said it's their choice. It's not their choice. It just happens to be no, the situation. No, it is their choice. We give every parent and student the choice to go to whatever school they want to in this district. And that's the power of choice. They don't relative to STEM. There's a waiting list. There's a lottery. But there's nothing at any of the other schools. When they're full, they're full, and you can't go there. We're talking about STEM right now. When you say then, then we would take that out. Okay, I agree with then, then take it out. But then you put a label on it that says, nope, because they're not, they're, they're, a cla they're, they're set above. I, I wish I could remember what you said, but then you put a label in that place. No label 
if, if they're not going to represent the demographics of the community, if we're going to look at the demographics and we're going to look at the community and we're going to make sure that it is exact, <laughs> and if it's not, then strike it. But then don't put in something else in its place that says because they are elite or something, because that's not true either, because it is a choice. You have to be careful about quotas. Not a quota, it's not like we're going but we're so way. far away from it. Well, we're so far off of it. I would, are we though? I'd like to see the numbers. And we're not making any progression. And it hasn't changed in some time. I would time. love to see the numbers in relation to the STEMs, individ both individual schools compared to the whole district, because the charter school is not a surrounding neighborhood. It's a whole district. Lisa's got it. Yeah. Do you have, I have it? Yep. I have the numbers for um, the demographics for kindergarten through eighth grade at um, STEM. So uh, roughly Asian, we have uh, about 10%. Uh, black or African American, we have 1%. Hispanic, we have about 10%. Multiple is about 2 to 3%. So that's where we are. So and now I know you that need I to know the demographics close. of the school district of Waukesha. Because the charter school is not a neighborhood school, it would right. represent the whole district. Are you asking? Because I mean, there's not a lot. There's not a lot of Hispanics living on Charles Avenue. There just isn't. Are you asking the demographics of the district? Yeah, you'd have to. I think it's like thirty-three percent Hispanic, at least. A third of the people that live in Waukesha, twenty thousand, or twenty-five thousand of, of the student yeah, population. The yeah, and uh, I'd I, say I, that, that's right. It would have to be the student population too, not just people who live here. And which which? But I don't think there's. I don't think. I mean, a third. Would, I think would be high. I, Actually, it's better than I thought. <laughs> it's changed over the. It has changed. Well, it has over changed the years. because I mean we're, we're which is good. For STEM has My changed. Is is what I'm quotas. saying. STEM has changed. You, you can't put years. in a quarter that you need. Say it's 15 percent Hispanic in the district, so we need 15 percent of that population. You can't do that either. <coughs> That's a slippery slope. No one's asking, nobody's slope. Nobody's asking for a quota, right? There's a standard in here to reflect the diversity. I of the would district. agree 100. Are we going to strike that? Do we feel that we don't need to reflect the diversity of district in a special choice school? What page is it on, Kurt? It's diversity's top of page six and yeah, top of page seven. Bottom of page six, top of page seven. I got it highlighted. Yes, uh, Thank on you. page seven of their sheet, page eight of ours. Yeah, it's on the top paragraph. <laughs> Yeah. WSTEM will monitor demographic makeup of the student Means population. Means achieving racial ethnic balance is the heading of Article Ten. But also this one here. Oh. Yeah, two sections of it. That's mm -hmm. yeah, so important. We have it in there twice. That's odd. That's isn't it? Look, we're spending a lot of time on this. We're I really, a lot of time I on really it. think we need just more time before we. we I think we need it. a little bit more data of the makeup of the of the student population of the school district of Waukesha so we can compare it. Why make the assumptions at a, at a committee meeting? Let's see, let's get the data. We, we, this is a, a district that's driven on data, am I right? So let's see it. Ms. Boyd? I'm thinking what it says here is that they will monitor the demographic makeup and if a group is underrepresented, they'll make outreach efforts to further, um, Outreach efforts will be further customized to raise awareness and generate interest. So by having informational meetings, this is saying they're going to do the kinds of things that we're talking about, and it's built into their charter, and this isn't a change in the charter. This is the original charter. But they haven't been doing it. Well, I and think the they results, have. the results aren't showing up. This, this, how long has STEM been in existence? We're in our ninth year yep. of operation. In our ninth year. But if they're looking at 23%, 24% of their population being in the minority status, I think you have to speak to the fact that you also have learning disabilities that are, that are represented now to, you know, what, what are you looking at in terms of your, sec, you know, your, your diversity? You know, I'm, I'm looking here at, at having a, a club that you're starting to be able to address the needs of kids with sexual, you know, orient, gender status, et cetera, kinds of issues that might be part of it. I think that they're really making making an effort to outreach to a lot of different areas. And I, I'm, I'm thinking 23% is higher than I expected it to be. I think we maybe aren't realizing all the things that they're doing. 23%, 10% Asian. I don't think we have a 10% Asian community. Okay, 10% Hispanic, we're probably double that across the district. It just doesn't reflect the demographics of the district, not even close. And um, I just think that we should spend more time trying to figure out how to get that done as part of the charter. That's all. 
And, and they're saying that outreach efforts will be, you know, be made. And I think that that's one of the things that th this will prompt more work from the part of their committee to, to, to further look at. We've been there nine years, and this is the results. And that's with that charter. But I think not going to change. Yeah, and I, I, and I guess I would respectfully disagree with you on that, Kurt. We have made outreach efforts quite a bit um, between the district activities, between PR working with Terry Schuster, um, everything at during the summer at the activities that are over at the park grounds. Um, we attend every single event that the district hosts at the high schools, the student fairs, the enrollment activities. We're at everything. It's so not working. Say, You're not getting the results. You're not making the demographic targets that are, out, that are expected through your charter. I guess I would ask to compare it then, similar to what Pat said to the rest of the district, just to see if that statement is accurate. And again, respectfully so, because um, I don't, necessarily agree with that I guess um, and just I think you know the, the statement's accurate that's Pardon? what frustrates me you know it's accurate that we don't reflect the demographics of the district in STEM I'm not saying it's your fault no, I'm not saying we have to make a quota I'm just saying let's look at other ways where we can kind of drive that so we get closer to the closer to the goal no quotas no quotas, no quotas. Sure. <laughs> okay but I think the lottery system, the exclusiveness for parents, for teachers and administrators, for their kids, those things don't help. Those are actually a hindrance to, to trying to drive that diversity. Would you see the opening up then of the seating supporting what you're discussing right now? I think we, the board needs to just have a broader discussion. These are just concerns I have. Not everybody has them, Okay. obviously. But, well. Let's get the numbers so we can yeah. end that debate. That debate, we can, we can debate that all night long, but, just, but until we get the numbers, I mean, let's just get the numbers. Let's get the demographics. You got Wise Dash Local up? You could probably pull that right now on Wise Dash. Um, I put it in my notes. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't take that long. I could do it tonight, too. Yeah. Well, we probably so beat, could you. We probably beat this horse. You, you have do, more to present, right? right? You have more to yeah, present? Um, this, that wraps it up. I mean, that's it. We just need to know. I mean, that's just Rick summary do it. and hey, thanks. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> we may have some questions once we get the numbers. <laughs> well, we talk mostly about demographics. Are there any program improvements that you guys are looking to make as you move into the next couple of years? I mean, it's the five year agreement. Um, have transitional issues relative to STEM as we go forward? Yeah, definitely. We have, um, so a lot of it is discussing between elementary to middle and middle to high school. Um, I guess I'll start with the elementary to middle. We've built a lot of transitional courses in throughout the summer as well as throughout the year. I guess in the first year or two, it was, um, to Joe's point, the, the thing of students coming and not necessarily knowing what it was all about and families saying, well, what is this? This isn't what I signed up for. Um, the classes we offer during the summer are open to the entire district as well as our students. And it's transitioned to middle school, not just to STEM. So there's that component. We've built in what we call a boot camp into the first 16 days. Similar to the rest of our system, it's competency-based. So it's teaching you as a student things about transitioning to classes, to lockers, to choosing projects, to conflict resolution, collaboration, innovation, public speaking, things like that, that students may not have done. So it, it, I don't care if they've gone to Randall or they've gone to any school in the state, they get this opportunity. Um, on the flip side, we've worked on things from the transition from middle school, not just STEM, but middle school to high school, deadlines and due dates, conversations, testing, standardized testing things. I think the misnomer about our school sometimes is kids never take tests, right? That it's all projects all day, every day, and it's kumbaya every class. Um, and to a point, it, it is that sometimes, but there are standardized test map tests, state tests, um, all the high school classes we offer anywhere from algebra through calculus AB right now. Students aren't doing things that supplement those classes or that supplant them, I should say. They're doing everything and then beyond, plus the experiences. Um, we also are working closely with GE right now to expand our music program. I don't know if you know or not, you may. 100% uh, of our students are in a music program, whether it be band, orchestra, choir, or general music. Um, the largest thing I went after with GE, I know a lot of schools focus on a library and the, the flower beds and things like that. We're doing all that. The very first thing I asked to focus on was our fine arts wing. So we're redoing our art, our creative cafe, our band, our orchestra room, and a recording studio to really hype up the fine arts and really get that amplified in our school. I think that's really critical. There's no, 
there's no A in STEM, right? So everybody always says, why do you focus so heavily on the arts, music, and all that? And studies would show and research would show, and I'm not going to beat that dead horse, but it works. It does. And kids have interest in that. Um, and a lot of kids discount that after elementary, and it's lost forever. And I think you're seeing a, a decrease in that. A huge focus on that is, is with GE in our, in our community day. Um, as well as, I just wrote another $25,000 grant for activity, physical activity. I think we're one of the only middle schools in the state with recess, which might seem small and minuscule, but it isn't to me. We wrote a grant two years ago for specialized bicycles. We have 25. I just wrote a grant for another 25 more. I'm pretty sure we got it. And if we didn't, we'll find money to get 25 more bikes. So that physical activity piece is huge too. In a STEM school, again, where you think kids are in front of a, not you, but it's, again, sometimes thought kids are in front of an iPad all day or a computer or coding or whatnot. I think our system has become so much more than a STEM program. STEM to me is just an umbrella for an experience for personalized learning where these students have choice in what they really want to do. And then there's all these underlying efforts to continue lifelong skills that we really want them to have outside of just science, tech, engineering, and math. So they can go to any school. I don't care if it's southwest, north. They've got these skills. Collaborate, innovate, create. But the conflict resolution, the public speaking, things like that. We've had students present up here countless times that I am just blown away by the, the lack of fear that they have coming up here and the skill set that they have to present to the board, let alone that, but adults, you know, and even peer to peer. So those are all things we just continue to develop. Um, we're also a mentor school for other schools around the state based on our program model. Um, we're continuing to host tours to, to involve our students in telling the story and then being able to articulate so it's not just us telling the story. So we continue to evolve that, I think, every day. It's and, I think, and I think that that's something that is, imp is important, and I would invite all of you to come in because it is an experience. It is an experience to come through, to walk through, and have a level one student, a kindergartner or a first grader, explain to you what they're doing in the classroom, what excites them, what makes them happy. Because at the elementary, you know, we're building that foundation. We're growing them, we're getting them ready, we're creating that independence, that ownership of their learning to be successful when they get up to Saratoga, where it is more open, where there is a little bit more freedom. We have voice and choice down at at, at Randall just as much as they have at Saratoga. But to really hear those students empowered and excited about like their strategies, about math, about learning, about what's happening, about what's going on. And those students are leading those tours, so that's really exciting for other educators from not only Wisconsin, but across the country to come to Waukesha School District to see that and to hear that. I, I just have one more question on the priority enrollment. Um, the administrator staff enrollment do you have an idea of how many staff and administrators currently benefit from that part of the enrollment? Well, I can tell you that there's no administrators benefiting from that because there's two of us sitting right here and I know neither one of our students go to STEM. Are there educators that benefit from that? I don't need to know specific educators or anything like that. But are there educators that benefit from that? I, I believe we have two on our staff. Okay. Um, I, have t I have two in my building. Yeah. Both. And again, it's choice, but the conversations we've had with those staff, because it's known, right, it's public, um, the two that are there are adamant that this is the best fit, similar to what Karen spoke to earlier. The other 70% of our staff probably have kinder through eighth grade students have said this, this would not be a great fit for my kid. I love it. It's a great fit for these students. My student might struggle here. A couple years later, they might try it. But right now, we have two. <coughs> yeah. Well... Obviously, once they're in, they're in, as far as I'm concerned. We'd never move people out that are in. But this is another unique benefit that we don't offer across the district, nor do I know of any other district where an employee gets priority over the residents of the district, really. Are there, in, can I ask, can I ask, are there enrollment caps at, like, so for example, at Rose Glen? So if I had a student, so there are caps. So I have a high school student, and if I wanted him to attend West, if could they're he go? closed to open enrollment, you couldn't. Right. Yeah. Or if you were a teacher at West, you couldn't well, get priority for that child. Right. Your and child. If, was closed. Right. I and think it's the problem. Like our space. Like if we didn't have space, the teacher wouldn't be able to bring their. You know what I mean? If we didn't have a seat, a teacher wouldn't be able to bring their student in. Well, the problem with this, the, the education portion of it, it also restricts the access for future. Right? Because once you're in, you're in. 
So it's you're not going through the normal lottery system. You're getting in because you're an employee of the district and you're getting special access to the school and it's taking away seats from the lottery process. Mr. Ronichek. So if a parent, say from New Berlin, brought their child to West because there was a spot, the next year, let's say it was closed, they would already be in the system. Mm -hmm. So that would be the same for them too. You have to play every year, don't you? You have to play every year, don't you? No. Once well, you're in, you're in. Every There's district nothing. has different policies on um, open enrollment. <coughs> Aaron, I, there's nothing wrong with me saying once you're in, you're in for STEM either. I mean, once you're in, you're in. You can't kick a... Well, we open enrolled to higher before we went to STEM, and that was in kindergarten. And I didn't have to do it each year once they were... Right. Once you're once in, you're, you're, in, in. you're in. Yes. It's the same here. I mean... Not a district? Some, some, again, every district has... You write your own policy on that. Most often, though, once you're in, you're in. Sometimes there's language that at the break, like um, elementary to middle or middle to high school, that you may be asked to re-enroll, but most, what school board wants 20 people standing here, you're kicking me out and I've been here six years, it doesn't happen. So that, that's the norm. Again, there's flexibility for each district to draft their own policy related to that. So if that... If I'm, if you're thinking I'm saying that once you're in, you're, you can be put out. No, that's not what I'm saying. <coughs> what I'm saying is that you have a situation here where we create a special opportunity for our employees to put their children in the STEM, which takes away future opportunities because now they have those seats occupied and it can't be put into the lottery system going forward because those seats will always be occupied. We'll never take those until they leave the system. They'll never, we'll never force them out to open up seats for others. But, but that's the same at every school is what I'm saying. Every school doesn't have a lottery system with a, a enrollment. When they have enrollment issues, you don't get in in the first place. Correct. It's not, a, it's not a lottery. But what they're saying is in that first year, let's say I'm a teacher and I want my student in, if there's not any space, they're not getting in. They don't bump a student out. No, but they're taking space away from future students when they get in. If that happens to be correct but same with another school if I was a New Berlin resident and I came and I taught at a school and I brought my child that child would be in and the next year they might not have space for somebody else but other schools aren't restricted to enrollment like our stem school is where you have to get in through a lottery system the yes, STEM it's a is lottery, unique. but we do have restrictions on enrollment Kurt once the school is full it's full but you always have an enrollment option every year because kids lead the system and when they leave the systems you take in new kids. So you've had you've had new enrollees every year you've had STEM, correct? Correct, sir. Mm -hmm. I mean based you'd on, have to. Based on openings per grade level at right. this point. Yeah. I guess I would keep going back to that switching the cap on the schools then versus grade levels. Everything you're saying right now sort of speaks to that being a better system in my mind. I'm not, against, I'm not against doing that either. I'm all for that. Okay. I'm saying there's other things we need to look at, too. Yeah, I would if we're going to fix the opportunity issue. But that's, I just wanted to get that clear, and I know it's for staff members. And be assured I'm not asking to take away their children's right to be in STEM. They're already there, I right? I don't, nobody should be afraid that we're trying to throw them out of STEM. That's not the goal. We appreciate the feedback and the time to share, definitely. Um, Mr. Como? So at what point in time do we need to <clears throat> have this done, Darren? It, a month from now, two months from now? Do we have <coughs> all summer? And I don't think we have all summer, right? We do not have all summer. There's some... The charter agreement. There's a guy at, at home with a sore head right now that can answer that question very clearly. Yeah. I. Um, <laughs> I don't know, but I do think oh, it's you somewhat had to be timely. an enrollment uh, expert. Well, I was going to ask: is, <laughs> Does this topic come back to F and F? Not that I wouldn't. I mean, I would love to pass this on to another committee. I just want to make sure this is the right venue um, for this discussion. I, you know, Mr. Como, you're the board president. Maybe this is one of those things where we should have a work session of the board on. You know, it's a big, it's a five-year deal. Or if we want to shorten it. 
you know. But I do. I would say we probably have to get this charter done. At the this next, this next to me meeting. seems like it's more teaching and learning than well uh, than financial. We approved the charters. We've approved always approved this charter and and the contract we, we of the can charters. Get, we can we, get a lot done in a workshop, though. Yeah, I think the and whole, I, the I don't whole mind board. having a workshop on it. Yeah, well, we can definitely bring it for teaching and learning. I have no problem with that. So we'll we'll figure that, be, we'll, that, that easily could be agendized for the next meeting. We'll figure well, out what the next best step is. Well, the reality is it shouldn't go to teaching and learning as here. We do charters, we do the contracts, we've asked for the information, they know what information we're looking for, bring it back and we'll have our vote at the next meeting. We'll be able or to, you can have a work session in between now and the next meeting. doesn't matter to me. I have on my list of things, um, process for the other schools, lottery, your selection, um, uh, the, the demographic data demographic that you were asking mm -hmm. for, and then um, I wrote down the referral process just as something to um, think about as we get ready to come back and talk about so, it next time. So if we continue with past practice, um, we've had these discussions come through FNF. And then they move to the full board. So, you know, why don't we just keep going along those lines? And if, you know, when we get to the full board discussion, if we're feeling like we need to take some more time, we will. And maybe we need to have a workshop after that. But maybe this gets worked out between now and the next F and F meeting. And then when we bring it to the full board, maybe it's maybe it's pretty Pretty clear, and we can have a full discussion at the full board yep. after it gets through F and F. Let's just continue. I'm sure, I'm sure let's it'll continue make it, the normal process. I'm sure it'll make it through F and F to the full board. I let's have continue no the normal process. But I, you know, maybe after. So let's say we do F and F, we go to the full board next month, and we're feeling like, hey, hold it, this is going all over the place, and we can do a workshop. That's fine. Excellent. So we'll uh, agendize it for May. But I do think we're looking for action. In May, is that or yeah. technically that we'll try to get it done in May. Yeah. If if you guys come back with you know the main you know we talked about stuff like do you really want the same language in terms of enrollment priorities? Um, is there some additional ideas. You know, I threw some out on how we can drive diversity that we can put into the charter or. or commit the district to in terms of helping to support you guys. I'm not trying to say it's your fault. I'm saying we need to work on this together, right? Can you turn on the microphone? Sorry, sorry. Um, to be clear, so I know how to work my calendar um, and so we can schedule. Are we talking, like, do you want Jim and I at a work session? Do you want all of this data compiled and then brought to the work session? Like, right. what back, is Back that to F and F. Unless Mr. One month from now. One yeah. month from now. Work with Darren. You'll come back here one month from now. We will be meeting the the Monday before the second Wednesday of May. Then hopefully it comes out of committee um, in May, you. and it goes to the full board two days after the committee meeting. Okay. So May 6th is our... 530 here. And if, and, if, well. and, if for, and if for whatever reason when we're at the May 6th full board meeting or May 8th full board meeting um, and we feel like we need some more time, then we'll probably do a workshop. And then we would have a different set of instructions for you at that time. But hopefully we'll be able to work it through the F&F &F committee okay. process. Thank do you, you. Do you know why this is a five-year charter instead of a three-year charter or two-year charter? Um, Five-year charters are standard. That's usually what charters are. Um, the charter has, in the past, now obviously I've only been here for three years, so I can't speak, but I have looked at the charter from the beginning. Uh, it was a five-year charter. It was renewed for another five years. And so typically, and I was at a charter before I came to Waukesha, and they were five-year charters as well. I think that that's standard operating procedure. No, typically, Kurt, on the... DPI grant cycles, they're five-year cycles as well. So there's a initiation, like the opening. There's an expansion, things like that. So it, but it you're not applying for a DPI grant relative to this charter, is that correct? Currently, no. There's, okay, so that's, that's a whole different discussion to your yeah. point earlier about expansion, yeah. So You and I could go out for coffee and talk about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I don't think there's anything that says it has to be five. Um, 
I can it, check into that. With if you, you would, yeah, I'd like, appreciate that. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, okay. All right. So we'll agendize it for May. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keep up the good work, too. Good things happening at the school. Okay. Now, well, information items. Monthly budget. Oh, wait, we're past that. Yeah. No, we're not. No, we're on information. Information item. Monthly budget updates. Apparently, my updates are that forgettable. That <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so <laughs> tell us we're all fine. <laughs> we are. All fine. I think you give the best budget updates in the district, Sherry. <laughs> Thank you, Darren. <laughs> I want to tell you it's really gone up in quality since you've. Uh... Oh, I'm sure. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, for March, um, it really is everything is on track where we expect it to be. Local revenues, our main source were taxes. Um, we're at. About the same collection rate as we were last year, so very close. State sources, we received our equalization aid and our per pupil aid, a little over $20 million combined for those. The per pupil aid this year increased by $204 per student, um, so it was at $654 per student this year, which was a nice amount. Um, federal sources, just some minor grant money coming in, expenses, everything really is where we expect it to be. There's nothing jumping out. Um, some of the library book accounts jumped high because we got our allocation for common school fund and it was higher than what we budgeted for. So they're running to um, make those purchases before the end of the school year. Um, capital objects, we had some credits. That was mainly for resale of technology that we no longer need. We had no Fund 10 debt retirement. We did have our principal and interest payment in Fund 38, so our energy efficiency payment. Nothing really in insurance and judgment. Transfers, the uh, $206,000 transfer in March was for our energy efficiency payment. It's the utility savings that we get that we have to take out of Fund 10 and transfer to Fund 38, and that's all part of that schedule with that particular project so uh, just one second so Sherry that that expenditure in the energy efficiency when do we stop making that those payments that means when we settle the account right when it's final when it's finally paid off yeah every year until the end I believe there's going to be some transfer till the end of the three three or four years so that'll be paid off in June 30 of 21 it's coming oh. coming okay. soon we paid it off early, then yeah, must have. then this would be done. But then we can collect the levy to do it, right? Uh, right. Yeah. They don't allow, for whatever reason, yeah. they don't yeah. allow you to do that. And I think they, when they drafted the language or the, the law around this, they didn't think about how we could save money by paying it off earlier. But um, so overall, we're coming in at fifty nine point seven eight percent of our budget compared to sixty point five eight last year. So right on target with Fund 10, Fund 27, minimal activity except for our salaries and benefits every month. But other than that, we're getting our grant payments, we're getting our categorical aid. Uh, don't expect any surprises there. Any questions? Yes. Wait. You had mentioned that the Fund 27 Special Education Fund has been added to the monthly update. And I'm wondering where to, to act, look at that efficiently because this is a lot of pages of... I was trying to find it. <laughs> oh, um, the actual update is on page two of the packet. The when you're looking at the report, it is begins on page ten. So the actual budget report for Fund Ten starts on page. Excuse me, for Fund Twenty Seven starts on page ten. Okay. My recap starts on page two. And I should probably take that wording out of there because this has been on there for a long time. So the reason, the reason I ask is when I went to Madison to do a day of lobbying and they started talking about the special ed funding and the, um, the lack of 
reimbursement from the state for the mandated items. I was trying to figure out like what, what our shortage was each year, and, and Darren was kind enough to just give me some some dollar amounts to be able to use as talking points okay. when I was there. Um, so I was just wondering if there's any way to be able to have it a, a more more visible way of realizing this is the shortage that we have to pull out of Fund 10 to cover the, the, the lack of funds that we're receiving for special education costs. Absolutely, and that is in the, I mean, I can work on some charts, but that is on the budget under um, operating transfer. So if you look on page 10 okay. and the line item, it's the first budget line item that says general operating transfers. That is the amount that we expect to have to transfer at the end of the year to Fund 27 from Fund 10. So there's never any year-to-date activity until the final end of the year. We know what all of our expenses in Fund 10 are, and we've collected all of our revenue or put it in as a receivable. And then we take the exact amount that we need to bring Fund 27 to zero. But this is, given the budget that we have, that's the amount that we expect to transfer at the end of the year. And so you can kind of compare it. You can see last year's and this year's numbers. And that's exactly what you told me. <laughs> I can guarantee you every year that Fund 27 will be balanced. Because we transfer the exact amount needed to make it even. It has to be zero. Fund 27 cannot have anything but a zero ending fund balance. You can't have it. The rest of the funds, well, yeah. we need to work on that. But, but Fund 27 is a must be zero. That is your, I don't know if subsidy is the right word, but that's the operational dollars or local dollars that go into special ed. If you'd like to see some charts, I'm happy to come up with something that shows what percentage of that is of the overall Fund 27 budget, if that's helpful, any of that type of information. I'm happy to come up with something. I just whip something up and see I if say, it I think applies. it was really insightful to me to realize that this you're talking $18.9 million oh. that we're not getting reimbursement for mandated <laughs> services. It's been like that since the mid-70s. Uh, exactly. And, and, and that's, I, I guess, I, I'm new to this. It was and, supposed and, to be 100% covered back in the 70s, but... You know, <laughs> it, it's, it's just a real eye-opener for me, and, you know, that, that it's one of the, the things that I think, you know, more, if the community knew more about that, there might be more of an up a prize about the fact that you know, why are we having to do consolidation of schools and why are we having to do a variety of other things for budget cuts when... You know, there is a really a realistic source of where that should be coming from, and that wouldn't be necessary. And that's kind of the, the situation with Fund 27, because there's so many rules and laws mm -hmm. that are in place that we have to follow. Mandates. That cost money, right? Mm -hmm. The mandates. Mm -hmm. um, I will work on something to and see what we can come up with. Sometimes I wonder if it's worth the $3.5 million that we get from the federal government, because we would lose getting that revenue source, right? Yeah, it's closer to six million dollars. Okay. Our our um, categorical. No, aid. I'm not advocating for that. But yeah, no, you know, it is our categorical. Aid comes is to qu six, it begs 6. the question, 5. though. What? Why? Yeah. And the only other thing in the update is we do have our self-funded insurance in here, and through March we're still sitting in a very good position for this year. There's still time, though. So. <laughs> yeah, and it can turn. <laughs> it can turn. That's what I mean. It can, can turn at any moment. Overnight. One, one or two bad claims, and the whole thing can turn. But the good news is, as of March, we're sitting in a very, um, a good positive position. So, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we talked last month about, um, you know, we, we've been having eAchieve come in every year just to kind of give a state of the state of eAchieve, I guess. Um, but also, speaking of charter agreements, um, char your agreements are up and they'll be coming back to you uh, in May. I'd hope to have drafts of them to share with you tonight, but I'll probably email them out once I have them just so you can take a, a look at them and then include them in next month's packet. But um, but you, you had asked that Rick come before that conversation, so um, Rick's here to to walk us through a PowerPoint as well. Yep. Thanks for having me here today. Let's see here. There we go. So, um, 
uh, last time I was here, we, we spent a lot of time on a lot of history, uh, where we got to the point where we are today. Um, this presentation today will be mostly about uh, 2000, the 2018-19 the school year. <clears throat> um, just a, a quick rundown of the, of the points that I will be covering today. We'll talk about enrollment for this year. Uh, I'll spend a little time on student achievement, talk about our school improvement initiatives, um, talk about uh, a little bit on the marketing results from last year's campaign and how it played out for this year, and then looking ahead. There's a few other notable highlights, and, um, and then a brief summary of estimates of where we think we're going to end up for um, this school year on a financial side. So in terms of enrollment, we started the year with 819 uh, full-time students and another 148 uh, full-time equivalents from the part-time students. So we got really close to that 1,000 mark that we keep shooting for. Um, our current status, uh, due to some attrition, um, you can see we've, we're down about 50, 55 students overall uh, compared to the start of the school year. The small language here is just how we get to these two uh, part-time FTE numbers. Any questions on enrollment? Yeah, there's always a, a number that drop off as time goes on. Yes. As I recall, but I don't think that that is as large as what it has it been hasn't. sometimes. Uh, last year was the anomaly where at sitting at this time last year, we actually had more students. Um, that had never happened before, but you are correct. More students that dropped. No, we had more students enrolled here in April than we did in the third Oh, the third okay, went count, to, but, went but that was a real direction. anomaly. That had never happened before, um, but you're right. Being here in April to only be down 50 students um, is less than it historically has been. Typically, it would be more along the lines of 100, uh, give or take some. So I guess I've been here too many years, yeah. Rick. Yeah. So, so Rick, what? How do you explain that anomaly of last year? There must have been a reason for that because it was a lot of character, right? Yeah, um, we were left scratching our heads. Last year was really the first year where we really went full bore with online, uh, our, our online presence, and we think that that had a lot to do with it in terms of more people finding out that this was an option. Um, I think that may be playing into why it hasn't dropped as much, um, but we may have called out some of the available um, students last year as part of that so just from my i think these are very nice numbers i mean we're we're trending towards that number we're looking for mm -hmm. there shows a fairly good saw i mean it used to be we struggled to get over 600 right okay. oh yeah so these are good numbers talking about student achievement um, this graph that i'm showing you here is the first semester high school course completion rate uh, going all the way back to 2007 where it was 50 percent. This will probably be the only historical graph I show you on, on this slide here. This year after first semester we were at 77.2. You can see there's a slight downward trend that is a little bit concerning. I'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute. Um, we're still in the uh, mid-70s, which uh, compared to national averages is way up there for, um, for fully online courses, but still um, we would like it to be higher, and um, I'll get into a little bit more about what we think is going on there. Um, this is high school courses. We are seeing a similar trend for middle school courses as well. Now, when we really dug into these numbers, we, were, we wondered, is there, a, is there a specific group that really seems to be having trouble? And we found that there actually is, and, it's a, and it's a, uh, we were really surprised at how much of a difference there was. On this table here at the bottom, um, 
oops, let me get my, my thing out of the way there. This says percent pass, um, but this graph breaks down um, students who, who were with us on the first day of school, full-time students, and that number is behind the black bar there, 79%. And this number, 51%, is full-time OEX, which stands for alternate open enrollment. Those are students who joined the school after the first day of school. So there is a huge discrepancy in terms of course completion between students who are with us on the first day and students who join us partway through the school year. Um, and then this number, part-time, is just, a, just for reference, how do our part-time students do? Because all of these numbers together um, are what make up this graph. So when we, when we started noodling around what's going on with our open enroll, with our OEX students, um, well, we read the letters. Um, Jason Smith, our associate principal, and I read every letter for every application that comes in. And almost all of our students that come in after the year starts are coming in with some sort of significant challenge going on in their life, whether it's a health issue, anxiety, bullying, depression are way up there. I would say 90% of the applications reference anxiety, depression, or bullying somewhere along the way. And then there's some other miscellaneous things. So we know that those students are coming to us with some very significant life challenges that are affecting them. That's going to be an area of an area we really hone in on and focus on supporting those students better than we have in the past. Um, that'll, that'll make it into next year's school improvement. Mr. Como, What's the count of the OEX students? So roughly? That, that's a great question. Uh, 161 students would be, um, would be what's contributing here. Um, but currently, we, we are closer to uh, 200 uh, OEX students for the year. Ms. Ronichek. Thank you. Do the other students that come that start like before the beginning of school, mm -hmm. do they come to eAchieve due to depression, anxiety, or bullying, or are you just saying that the ninety percent of the ones that are coming in later mm -hmm. are? That's a great question too. The students who apply within the regular open enrollment window, February through April, um, don't have to submit a letter. So we don't know exactly why they're coming. Sometimes we find out after the fact as we get to know them. So we don't have a real clear picture on that. Um, what this number does not include are the students who apply through July through August. Those would not be included in the 166 just by virtue of their enrollment date, but technically they are also OEX students. They're just not represented in the numbers that way because we chose the first day of school as the the demarcation here. And um, those students that apply over the summer, it's the exact same pattern. They, 90% of the applications reference anxiety, depression, and bullying is also way up there. So when <coughs> I go to graduations, I mean, a lot of the children that I, graduates I talk yep. to, mostly graduates, Quite often, a lot of times they said they'd come to UCHI because they wanted to get out of a bullying situation. I, I find that's really at least one out of four, one out of three I'll talk to For will sure. say they've chosen it because they weren't, they weren't, didn't feel comfortable in their mm -hmm. prior school environment. Um, so do we have a lottery to get into UCHI? Not right now. Not right no. now. Mm -hmm. So there's no constraints. Anyone can apply. Demographic-wise, you'd expect it to match the demographics of the state? <laughs> um, I'd have to look and see what the well, demographics... Well, they do. By the okay. way, I've checked. Okay. Just right now. <laughs> okay. You're right on line with the demographics of the state. That okay. shows that you have a very open enrollment process <laughs> with no restrictions, and something that you should be commended for. Oh, well, thank you. Continuing on with uh, student achievement, um, we'll turn our attention to the MAP test. 
And this would be, uh, this is the MAP test of this year. The reason why I chose to focus on MAP test is because we do have a very high turnover rate of students who only intended to be with us for a year or they tried it and they realized it wasn't the right fit. Uh, every year, historically, we about 50% of our students are new to us each year. So the MAP test is really one of our best gauges for our current student population. Um, but when we take the MAP test, we found uh, when we gave the MAP test in the winter, which would be kindergarten through 10th grade at eAchieve, we found that only 44% of our students were at grade level in math and only 67% in reading. Um, when we look at it a different way in terms of a growth measure, um, we found that from fall to winter, only 51% of our students, and this would largely be the students that started on the first day of school, that'll be important when I, when I show you some other data later, 51% had met their growth projection uh, and 56 uh, in, in math and 56% in reading. Again, those are much lower numbers than we would like to see. Um, and um, when I talk about our school improvement, you'll see that we have a lot of robust uh, activities going on to address math and reading. If we drill down on these numbers and look at them, uh, group them by elementary level, and again, parse out the students who started with us on the first day of school, compared to those who joined later. This is just at grade level um, because there wouldn't be a growth measure for those who joined us later. We notice at the elementary level in math a huge disparity between the students that were with us on the first day and the students who joined after the first day of school. A 20 point difference in their ability to be at grade level in math. So they, so what this shows us is that our elementary students come to us v extremely deficient in math and then we need to try and take them from wherever they are and move them on. The same pattern, even worse, I should say, uh, shows up in reading where students who have been with us all year at the elementary level, 65%, and then we parse out the those that joined us partway through the year, a 36 point difference. So they come to us with very, very low skills and now we gotta try and move them up. When we look at middle school and high school, those numbers are reversed, which is last year when I was here, we saw that similar trend at all levels. But this year, for some reason, our OEX students are coming in with pretty strong skills uh, or strong, relatively speaking, which is peculiar to us and, and we're still trying to wrap our heads around why is this, what's going on, and uh, what are we gonna do about it, ne what are the next steps? But I would think that what we're seeing up there was, to me, I expect that. Okay. Because if, if I'm looking to put my elementary child into eAchieve, it's quite possible I'm not satisfied with what, how they're doing and I want to take more direct control of their program. Correct, yeah. Um, by the time they get into middle school and high school, I see a lot of high achieving kids coming into the Achieve. Yes. Because it, pre it presents more opportunities for a vastly broad, vastly broad array of mm -hmm. curriculum than they can get at their local high schools. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say that from what I know about the Achieve, this meets my expectations. Mr. Como? Okay. What kind of remediation programs might we have for those students? So uh, most of our, uh, most of our, at the elementary level, we do uh, a number of different things. The elementary teachers hold a web conference for all students in the core areas every week. But then for students who are, who are identified as struggling, um, and the MAP test is one measure of that, the coursework that they turn in um, and the work that they do with their teacher. They have additional um, small group sessions with their elementary teachers throughout the week. So they get multiple, um, multiple literacy web conference sessions with their teacher. Are they required the week. to take it or is it optional? No, they're required. And if they don't participate in those, that counts against them in terms of 
non-participation, which could result in them being sent back to their resident school. Thank you. Continuing on with ACT, uh, now keep in mind what I said about um, our, our students are 50% are new every year. What we're looking at here are actually last year's ACT numbers because we don't have this year's yet. They've started coming in. I've, I've analyzed the first batch, that, which will be the largest batch, and they're, they're only a few tenths off, um, but we don't have all of the student scores yet. We probably have about 80% of the student scores, and we're only about two tenths off compared to last year, so I'm using last year as being fairly representative. This is a pretty big graph, and what it shows is the state, the district, eAchieve, and I think 13 of the other virtual schools in the state. The composite score is at the top, and the number of test takers is the little black number in the bottom. That's noteworthy because you could see eAchieve is the has the third highest number of test takers, and it's not even close uh, compared to all the others. When you consider that with our ACT composite, last year was a banner year for us um, for the ACT test. The other reason why the ACT we feel is a more accurate measure for us compared to the other state standardized tests is because this test really means something to many students. They realize that, they, that this is the score that colleges are going to see, as opposed to the forward test or the Aspire test, where last year we had 25% of our students opt out of taking the test. The families didn't want to drive to the venues where we were that. And when we analyzed certain grade levels, we found out, unfortunately, that that 25% that opted out were our best students which was disappointing. So this year, we looked at that and we encouraged, of course, all of our students, but especially our best students to really take the test, but it is up to the parents if they're going to opt out. Um, we were really pleased to, uh, to have our ACT composite be above the state average um, last year. I think that really adds legitimacy to our program and uh, speaks volumes about our teachers and the work that they do with uh, students, not only their pedagogy, but the level of caring uh, that they exhibit uh, and personal touch that they exhibit to the, to the students. That is just as important in a virtual school as it is in a face-to-face -face school. This is the end of my academics part, so this would be a good time to ask. Just, just real questions. question. Which, mm -hmm. Wisconsin Virtual Academy, is that Appleton School District? No. And I Weva, Weva, right here, is K-12's K program. K-12's, and what's iForward? iForward is out of Grantsburg, Wisconsin. Um, they, they used to be Insight schools that were also bought by K-12. Um, at the same time, they bought our old contract. So, but they, just like we did, they, they banded together and said, we can do this ourselves. So iForward <coughs> is uh, independent, just like eAchieve is, run by its own school district. iForward is run by which school district did you say again? Grantsburg. Those are the two best comparisons from a, in terms of the number of students that took the test. Right, right. eAchieve is... We're significantly higher. Right. Yeah. eAchieve is, um, is still the second largest, when you consider K, K through 12, is still the second largest virtual school in the state. Um, close behind us, though, is Bridges. Uh, there was a year where they jumped ahead of us by a few students, but Bridges does not have a significant high school program, as you could see by the number of juniors that took the ACT test. They're primarily a um, ele uh, elementary program that especially caters to um, homeschoolers where they, they, they really partner with the family and the family helps choose what the, what the curriculum is going to be. Moving on then. 
In terms of school improvement, um, our focus this year uh, and, and also last year was reading and numeracy. Um, to that end, uh, we had all of our elementary teachers participate in the first round of AVMR training. And they are also then moving on to the second round of AVMR training. Um, one of them is currently doing it and the other two are going to do it uh, this summer. What's the acronym stand for? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> but it's, it, what I can tell you is AVMR is, is one of the, is, the, is kind of the, uh, is one of the district um, blessed programs uh, in terms of this is the, this is the professional development we want you to participate in. So my point in saying that is we are participating with the rest of the district in the same professional development that the rest that the district math teachers are getting. Um, we also sent uh, most of our teachers to and my and I also went to summer avid training as part of the summer institute. Um, in term and uh, and we learned a lot there. Every meeting, <clears throat> every meeting we have, faculty meeting on the on the special professional development days, really is uh, professional development on reading instruction. Um, it's also what our PLCs are focused on. They meet every month to to share ideas, to to demonstrate to each other, to get ideas and feedback. Uh, from their colleagues about what they're doing and how they could do that better. And um, we also implemented a study skills class for students who don't have IEPs. This was something we had talked about last year um, as, as, as a way to support struggling students. So this would be the other, the other uh, prong going back to student achievement where we have um, a teacher who works with them and, and does many of the similar types of things that a um, special education teacher would do for a student with an IEP. They talk about organization, goal setting, um, advocating with their teachers, breaking things down into smaller parts. It gives them someone that they're kind of checking in with a couple of times a week. So that's a, that's a program that we just started this year uh, and, and we have some students in that to provide more support for them. The last point of our school improvement plan that I'm really excited about is that <clears throat> you may have heard the term walkthroughs that happen at other schools. Um, we tried that for many years to try and make that work and it ju we just could not fit our square peg in that round hole. So what we decided to do instead was every month the teachers have an appointment with their administrator, either myself or Mr. Smith. And they show us what they're doing for reading instruction um, in their class. Uh, they have to choose two classes that they're focusing on. And they have to, they have to show us. Um, instead of us trying to find it, they, they bring it to us and show us, this is what I'm doing to teach reading skills in my two focus classes. This graph here um, is not intended for you to read. It's intended for you to look at the colors. And what it represents is the first column is September and the last column is March. As uh, Associate Principal Smith and I meet with teachers each month, each row is a teacher. And as we've met with them and looked at what they brought forward to demonstrate uh, reading instruction in their class, they were given a color of red if there really wasn't any reading instruction going on, yellow if there was a little bit of reading instruction going on, and green <coughs> if there was quite a bit of reading instruction going on. And you could see over the course of the school year that we move from largely red and yellow to mostly green. Um, what that tells me uh, is because I was the one choosing the colors, was there has been a tremendous shift over the course of the year in the amount of reading instruction that's taking place uh, in our uh, online courses. And when I talk about reading instruction, I'm talking about the teacher demonstrating a specific reading strategy or skill. They're modeling it for the student and saying, this is what, this is what I'd like you to do, now go try it. 
Now that could be happening live. It could be happening in um, in um, instructional short instructional videos that they post in their class. It could be through very scripted guided um, steps that the student has to follow. But a great uh, a great uh, improvement over the course of the year. So we're very excited about that. Any questions on school improvement? Mm -hmm. Can I check? Thank you. <coughs> and the white boxes, were they not doing it at all? The white box was, it got, it got missed for some reason that month. Um, that's what the white box is. Thank you. And in uh, studying your demographics again, this is where, I'm not sure why this is, but it doesn't look like the male-female percentages are within the state norms. No, they're way different. Uh, we have way, both, they're, they're a little more even this year than they were last year, but we have way more females attending eAchieve than males. I, I really have no idea why that is, but it is very peculiar. Choice. You can get data Maybe on choice. Grantsburg, but you can't get data on, on, on the private school as easy as you can. Oh, that doesn't surprise me. Well, now they've opened and closed a number of different schools, so sometimes it's a matter of of making sure you're looking at the one that's currently open, and it has to have been open for a couple of years before data will show up. They wouldn't show up on the porthole of the DPI it, for for um, Casey. Their private it, school. And you were looking under the McFarland School District. Are they under McFarland? Yeah. Okay. Weva is under McFarland. Okay. K-12 currently operates five different virtual schools in the state. And they're all under McFarland. Destinations is another one. And they reopened Insight Schools. So if you see Insight Schools currently, that's also K-12. All right, moving on then to um, marketing results. For the, nine, for the 18 19 school, this would be the work that we did last year in preparation for this school year. So we received 619 regular open enrollment applications. That would have been during the February to April window. Um, and that was up 23% over the previous, uh, previous marketing year. We had 177 summer OEX applications. Um, that would have been from July and August, which was up 7%. That uh, resulted in a 14% increase um, of student FTEs on the third Friday compared to the previous year. And then looking at how are we doing this year for OEX, OEX apps received this year, we received 304, which is actually down uh, quite a bit from last school year. In terms of planning, um, our, our marketing plan is in full swing right now since we're two thirds of the way through the, uh, the, um, the window for this year. Uh, we did make a few adjustments. We, we sponsored, uh, we paid for sponsorships and also set up booths at the Milwaukee Kids Expo, as well as a family egg hunt. That one happened just last weekend. That one was in Brookfield. Lots of little kids running around, getting their faces painted and playing Plinko at our booth. We had Plinko and, um, and a giant Connect, uh, Connect Four and talked to a lot of parents uh, at those at those. We bought a premium listing on uh, niche.com, which already has generated 20 highly qualified new leads. Niche.com is just a, a place where schools are rated, but you can pay to, to have your school pop up and other people can see it while they're looking at the ratings. Um, we tweaked some of our social media campaign based on what we saw in last year's results, the ones that didn't really generate many leads, we cut out, and the ones that gave us more leads, we beefed up a little bit. Um, we're continually revising our website, and um, we shifted some funds from TV to on-demand and pre-roll video ads for when people are going online to look at videos. They may have a... Uh, they may have an eAchieve 
15 second spot pop up that they have to watch before they get to the video that they want to watch. Um, all in all, um, oh, this was the big finale, there we go. Um, we are dead even with last year's uh, results in terms of apps received at this time. Now we still have just under a month to go, so we'll see how it pans out. Um, hopefully we continue on the trend. Um, we, will, we will see. Any questions about marketing? Shut up for a second. Um, that would be helpful to see for them. This is what we did, and this is what we're going to try to do next year to get a more diverse population. All for it. So glad we're on board on that one. <laughs> so in terms of the... Uh, marketing piece. I know you had an assessment done um, yes. by a group I knew, and I understood they did a nice... They did a really nice, very thorough job, yes. Did you make any adjustments from that? Yes. I never saw it. I just heard it was done. And Yep. So... Um Oh, uh, so one of their key one of their key findings in terms of things that we could do better is uh, there were two really two big things that came out of that in terms of things that you could do better. One was on our social media sites we could uh, be more organic in terms of instead of touting all the good reasons someone should go to a virtual school or might want to consider a virtual school, actually show your students in action, show your teachers in action, um, tell personal stories about actual things going on in your school. That'll help um, increase the engagement on your social media. And the other thing was um, in terms of online presence and organic search engines, um, we were doing a, we were way ahead of industry standards in, in terms of driving the business to our website, but they quickly then left because it wasn't really what they were looking for. So the recommendation was don't be so concerned about driving traffic to your website as you are as driving qualified traffic to your website. And so that's been an area of focus for us too. It's been a... Como? So how are you determining that? Are you looking at a conversion rate? Yeah, click-through rates, yes. Mm -hmm. So one of, the, one of the interesting things that uh, we're trying to navigate right now, we, we, we hatched upon a, a great idea that was showing excellent promise where, where we, would be, we, we were hosting our own web pages um, that listed the names of, of all the schools in other districts. And then we also said that eAchieve is also an option if you live in this district. Um, and that was, that was seeing some very robust results, but uh, we had a, a number of superintendents complain from other districts. So we have pulled that back and are retooling how we might reword things uh, to still have that same message out there, but to make it um, less offensive to other districts. I, I don't understand that. You know, you, it, if they could offer what we have to offer, then it wouldn't be attractive to their ch children. And, right? I, I, I'm, yes. That's and because we're a public school, they can complain to our superintendent, but I bet you Casey Distant Learning wouldn't listen at all. They would go ahead and go after those kids. They probably would, yeah. So we're trying to, we're trying to, we, we, we're, we don't want to make enemies, so we're trying to retool the message in such a way that um, is not offensive, um, but still gets the message out that we are, we are an option if you live in this district. What was, ha what was happening is that people were searching online for online options. I, you know, I live in such and such district and I'm looking for online options. Well. We're, we're an option you can choose, but they don't know that. that was, that's the whole point of the, the, the online presence and the search engine. But, so we just have to find a little bit better way to, to get our message out there. 
Maybe it's just simply listing where the students live, where they're from, and don't even mention oh. the school district. I see. We have students from, so on our websites, well, yeah, I like that idea. Algoma. I like Green that idea. Bay. Then get them to tell their story online, too. Mm -hmm. Yep. So That's the social media part, yep. So that they can, yeah. they can practice telling their story, and mm -hmm. they don't have to give their full name. They can say, I'm Jane from... Great ideas. Thank you. Ms. Ronchek? I just had a hot. Our business, we have five stars on Google. And every time someone new sits in my chair, I say, how did you hear about us? And they say, well, I just, I just Googled hair salons and yours came up first. And you guys have five stars. But after each person checks in, it says opt in to SM Marketing. And it just basically is like, um, you know, when we have specials or whatever. But after every person leaves and they get their receipts. It's not printed, it's emailed or texted. It says, how did you like your experience today? And it just takes one second. Mm -hmm. And then that, that goes right to the five stars or whatever. So oh, if, nice. yeah. So if you could ask your students yeah. to <coughs> rate their experience. That, that's really powerful, it is. Yes, I'm, I'm not kidding. 10 new clients I just had a week in the last month, every single week. And that's just one person, and we have eight of us. So every single one of them is telling me they're getting it from Google. Everyone. Yep, yep. we really believe that on that online presence is really where it's at in terms of um, getting our message out there. So ideally, let's say if you had the best website or the best social media mm -hmm. contact site that they access it through social media and it's at the end of watching the video that the pop-up would say rate this video rate rate your experience here mm -hmm. with the five star thing that probably would feed back into your metrics mm -hmm. and yeah. it, it would be the metrics on the on the web search not necessarily the school so but if you get five stars on anything right right, right. that's yeah. all that matters right five five is always good Okay, you're not not likely to get a one on a on a <laughs> on a video. <laughs> sure. So. Okay. Okay. Moving on then. Um, two other notable highlights. Um, we've been working for five six years on NCAA accreditation. Um, ever since we ever since we split from K-12, K-12 actually lost their um, NCAA accreditation at the time that we split with them, um, coincidentally. Uh, but uh, we've been working, and finally this year uh, we received NCAA accreditation. So students who take classes from us, they need to specify up front, I want to have this count as one of my core 16 classes. They have to do a few, th one, just one thing really different. They have to attend every live e-session. That's our, our web conference with the teacher. That was the only way the NCAA would approve our accreditation is if we required them to attend every uh, live e-session every week with the teacher. The NCAA's big issue was you can't have students just go through classes as fast as possible, even though it will take them 90 hours and they could do it in three weeks. The NCAA didn't like that. So we had to figure out a way to slow it down so that the NCAA would be happy and that's what we settled on. So we're thrilled that uh, our classes are NCAA accredited now. The other really um, noteworthy thing is our work that we've been doing with AVID. There are very, very few virtual schools in the nation that are applying AVID uh, strategies, um, let alone have an AVID elective or any kind of AVID programming at their school. As you all know, uh, the district is a big AVID supporter and so is the Achieve. And uh, this year, um, our AVID team was invited to present at the national conference um, because of the work that we've been doing as pioneers in the virtual space uh, as it relates to AVID. So we feel very, very proud about that as well.
Almost. That'd be a great topic to organically discuss in video snippets. Yeah. You could probably have a whole bunch in AVID. Um, just great examples throughout the year, different levels of students, different things that perhaps they struggled with that they no longer do. Um, learning how to debate, learning how to present. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good, great idea. And then finally, we get to just some summary financial estimates for the year. Um, these two numbers are simply looking at my budget for the year, um, looking at what's the bottom line for Fund 10 and what's the bottom line for Fund 27. Those are really the only places we have expenses, and those are the, those are the two numbers we expect to come in right there at that number. There's really not a lot of wiggle room this year. Um, but So we expect to spend just about every dollar of that. In terms of revenue, um, these are the main sources of revenue for our district, and these numbers are based on the current students, that I, the current student population that I showed you at the beginning. So I'll just pause for a little bit to give you a little bit of time to digest how I got those numbers and where they're coming from. Here, those numbers would be bigger, right? Correct. So you basically these are the, the real numbers. Right. Yep. This is where this prorated line counts for students who withdrew. There's that, that there's that 57 students who aren't with us, and we do get some funds for the days that they were with us. And I just shot in the middle there, 65 days, um, just as an average. Then the last slide, unless anybody has questions on this slide, is simply the difference between the two. And uh, you could see that um, if our estimates are right, we should be uh, in the black uh, by two and a half to almost three million dollars. We need our accountant to certify the numbers. Jerry, is your mic on? Um, they're accurate. I worked with Rick on the numbers, and um, based on the open enrollment figures, without eAchieve, we would be in an open enrollment bad yes. place. We'd be spending more money out of district than we receive back in. So the only thing on those pages are for the resident information, that isn't that's an increase to our revenue limit, so it isn't flat out dollars that it's an increase to the revenue limit and it's works on a three-year rolling average so I would look at it that way but the numbers are very representative of a, a positive position that eAchieve is in for. The, the financing the calculation in terms of a break-even when you get to the resident kids I don't know where they would otherwise be going now if they're gonna just go to Banting instead of eAchieve then district-wide revenue is the same because we're serving it's the same with Montessori too with you know is that a good program or not I don't know where those resident kids would otherwise go you'd have to make some pretty broad assumptions but I was it two years ago we did a kind of a break even I think he achieves a positive financial um, um, program for us we could sit here and argue what that number is but overall I think it's a very um, financially stable program just Looking at these numbers, so um, it's two and a half million. I don't know about that because I, I, again, I don't know about the resident part of it. But um, but I think the the theme is correct. Um, well, on top of offering a unique service. It, yeah. It, so financial. what this says is that now that it's positive, let's just say it's positive. The more students we have, the more positive it gets, right? Absolutely. Yep. So the drive from our part, besides always making sure we offer an exec excellent program with good qualified staff and administrators is to drive enrollment up. Yep. And get the right type of students into the program. Absolutely. That applies to brick and mortar schools and virtual. It's, it's hard to get physical movement into our brick and mortar schools. No, it's I a know. little easier to move people through the ethernet to, you know, each. Mm -hmm. 
that's that's it then. That's the uh, end of uh, what I had brought for you. So if there are other questions I could answer for you, I'd be happy to. Otherwise, oh. I'm excited to see you next month when we talk about the eAchieve charter contracts. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a very good presentation. Thanks for waiting for us, Rick. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Referendum project updates. Yeah, this will probably be a, a constant, you know, tonight's report's um, just a quick summary of where we are in terms of the bid documents. Um, but at least every other month we'll be reporting out on the referendum work. So um, on April 3rd, um, bid documents were released that would bring 11 um, secure and structurally secure entrances um, to 11 of our schools. Uh, Randall, Hadfield, Lowell, Higher, Prairie, Meadowbrook, Bethesda, Rose Glen, Saratoga, some of you in West High School. Um, you add Banting and, and North to that list because they already have structurally secure entrances. Um, so we're we're actually doing twice as many schools as we originally had planned on doing um, in our very preliminary um, scheduling of things. Um, the one project that we ran into a, a, little, not a little bit of an issue, an issue is the elevator at Hawthorne that we had hoped to address. Um, the original drawings for that building are hit and miss at best. Um, and for those of you who've been around, maybe you know this, but the where the library is now, and we were going to put the elevator right next to the library. That used to be the the uh, gym and the locker rooms way back. And there's plumbing and things that until we got in there. So we're, we're, we're thinking now that that elevator is actually going to have to be a small addition to Hawthorne Elementary School. And with that, uh, when you get into addition, um, the conversation turned into where do we eventually want the office? Now, do you do an addition for that? Um, we've talked about traffic pattern there. Um, so we might try to um, send out a new bid document to, if it's an, a new addition, you could do that during the school year. Um, is it ideal? No, but it's not as disruptive as being in the building um, doing construction. So that one we're still working on, um, bringing a solution um, forward. Um, and we just want to be the right solution um, because it's you're not moving the elevator, obviously. So that's um, bids will be uh, due. Um, we're doing a on April 18th. It's a pre-bid walkthrough, and then on the 23rd of uh, April, the bids are all due back. So um, next month we'll be able to report out on the bid results, assuming the vetting of all the the trades are is complete. So at least give you a general idea of how that came. Um, uh, we're looking at about f just over four million dollars, if you remember, budgeted dollars for projects this summer. So the only other thing, um, I don't know if I can I connect easily. Uh, <coughs> this are. is our um, web page, and it looks very familiar. We kept the same structure basically as the referendum information. You can get back to the referendum information if you want. We're leaving that there for anyone wants to go back to the community survey. Or <clears throat> so what we've done is a little blurb, just the history of the the referendum and when it was passed, and then we have four sections. Um, there's an lot going on, the project updates. Once we have construction going, we'll be doing, um, I know last with the cafeterias, I'd include them in the Friday updates. Um, those things will be posted on here. I put the original financing plan out here, and then I'll update with, as we issue debt um, and the final interest rates, et cetera, come in, I wanna be able to have people look and see what the comparison, because I think we'll do a lot better than, or at least I'm hoping we do a lot better than what um, we had talked about. Um, the schedule is up here. This is a very broad schedule. Um, it's not very site specific, but it, it maps out um, uh, the work ahead. And then the most important thing that's out there right now is um, if you click right here, um, project bid documents, if someone is interested in um, pursuing a, a bid or be, being part of the project, um, oops, you can get to Findorf's site. Um, click here and then you just click on Waukesha School District which is right here and that will get you to um, you have to create a sign-in um, which is very easy essentially Findorf just wants to know who's looking at the bid documents um, and then they can go in and see the all the drawings for all the projects so uh, it's there for anyone who who has um, a level of interest in, in bidding on it's a pretty broad scope of work so um, we're moving along. We'll start construction. Um, 
April or June 11th, 12th, whatever the first day without kids, um, we'll hit the, hit the ground running um, at that point. So that's all I have for, um, we'll be issuing bonds and we delayed it because of the spend down thresholds and we were gonna, we weren't gonna hit those. So um, interest rates have held low. So um, that hasn't hurt us in, in terms of that. So yeah, so that's all I had for that uh, agenda item. We have a president that hates high interest rates, so they should stay low for a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, no discussion items, recommendation for future committee meetings. Anybody have any recommendations, things they want to have covered? We'll have a lot in our next meeting anyway, so. because We'll, we'll have another full agenda next month. <laughs> Okay, we do need uh, we do need a motion to go to closed session for the two items uh, indicated. I move to adjourn to executive session pers pursuant to Wisconsin statute 19.85 parent one parent e for delivering or negotiating the purchasing of public properties, the investing of public funds, or conducting other specified public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session. Yeah, go ahead, because there's Ex three of them. Okay, express swim agreement? Four of them. School resource officer agreement? Offer on Oakdale property and Department of Transportation settlement? I second the motion. Okay, let's roll call vote. Ms. Voigt? Aye. Mr. Como? Aye. Mr. O'Brien? Aye. Mr. McCaffrey. Aye. Ms. Ranchek. Aye. Motion passes 5 0. We'll move into executive session. We need about three minutes of topic, I say. They can be. Okay, we're now reconvening an open session from closed session. We have one item on, on remaining on the agenda that we're going to take action on. And I believe that's the DOT, Department of Transportation Litigation Settlement, on the land out on TT. Is that correct? Correct. We have a settlement in front of us. Do I have a motion to accept the settlement? Uh, I move to accept the DOT litigation settlement as presented. I second the motion. I have a motion by Mr. Caffrey, a second by uh, Ms. Voigt. Further discussion? We have to technically say that we also approve the release, because it's a release form that's the actual official document. Well, it includes, so the, would... it includes proving the release, so it's, okay. it's part of the Friendly, amend. friendly amendment. Okay, friendly amendment to and approve the release. Agreed. Property unencumbered. <laughs> Any other discussion? Okay, roll call vote. Aye. 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 Motion passes 5-0. Uh, no further business. We are adjourned. <laughs>